Welcome back to Ask the Compound. We're live from the Compound Studios across the street from Bryant Park in New York City. Jill on Money is here. Woo! Very excited. Very excited. We have so many good questions that I can't tell you about any of them because she wants to be surprised. Exactly. It's like uh, Stump the DJ, which is a very old reference. Rob, remember Stump the DJ? Remember what a DJ was? Uh, I'm, that DJs one's lost me. on me. I don't know that one. Mm -hmm. All right. Compound news letter. Weekly wrap of all compound content, in case you missed it. What else do we have there, Duncan? Uh, we're giving away the TCAP guess. Uh, oh, that's full, right. One week in advance. One week in advance. Yeah, you'll know who's coming. So. Called the Compound Insider. We put up a lot of content, so this is a way to keep up with everything. New merch drops, find out who the new guest is. The compoundnews.com slash subscribe for that. I'm sure it'll be in the show notes. Duncan will put it in there. It's in there. All right. I got a lot of questions. Let's get to it. <laughs> all right. Up first today, we have a question from Gabe. So Gabe asks, uh, I, I'm a high school English teacher married to a freelance photographer. I earn $120,000 a year, which comes with three plus months of vacation every year, not to brag. She <laughs> earns about $80,000. We're in our mid-40s and max out our, our Roths, current balance of about $200,000. My pension benefit will be about 70 to 75% of the average of my final four years mm. of salary. How do we factor this in when calculating how much we need to set aside in other retirement savings vehicles? How do I account for my pension's value in calculating our net worth? It's maybe a little silly to worry about, but I feel like our net worth is relatively low because we don't have some fat 401k <laughs> number uh, we can add into net worth calculations. Right, you just had someone on your show talking about retiring with a pension. It's pretty rare these days. I think I, I've looked this up before because a lot of people think, listen, in the past, everyone had a pension. I think the number topped out at like 45% or so in the 70s. Yep, Does that yep. sound about right? You know how many private sector pensions there are right now in this country? Was it 10%? 4 4%. Okay. Unbelievable, right? It's really low. I, I mean, that makes retirement planning so much easier. But this person is saying, well, actually, it's harder because I, I need to know what, what it's worth. Do you think it's even worth capitalizing that value? Like taking some sort of interest rate and finding the present value calculation, figure out this bucket of money is worth this. Because it's probably worth more than most people think. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think only if you just like to keep score. Yes. Which is a fun thing some to do for do. some people. I might look at it slightly differently for Gabe. I would say, hey, Gabe, how much do you and your freelancer wife, how much do you spend right now? Because you're socking away a lot of money, right? So they make 200 grand together. They're socking away money in their retirement accounts. Let's do a quick back of the envelope calculation, which says, hey, I spend this much today. And in the future, I will have a pension. I'll have two Social Security checks. Let's inflate everything to the future. And I bet you're going to be OK. Right. How much more income do I need? Yeah. It's like you invert it. Yeah. And I think that that's a smarter way to do it. Uh, I dealt with this. I don't know if you have a lot of friends who are teachers or municipal workers. They get so freaked out. They're like, I don't have a lot of money in retirement. I'm like, you're a New York City teacher. You have, like, f the equivalent of $4 million yes. in retirement, and you don't have to worry about it. Right. And, yeah, it's it's, it's parsed out to you evenly. Like, it, like, you're still getting a paycheck. It makes retirement planning 10 times easier. So do you think it makes sense for Gabe to say, here's the present value of that future pension benefit? I've heard some people say, well, if I have this pension, maybe I can be more in equities because hmm. I, don't, I have a fix. So I, I think from that perspective, it might make sense if you're trying to think through an allocation. But I'm like you. If you're trying to figure out how much do I need, that's the question everyone always asks. How much money do I need to retire? And it's almost impossible to figure out if you have decades and decades. But if you could say, here's how much I think I'm going to spend, like you said, add some inflation to it. Here's how much income we still need to account for that can help them figure out their, yeah. their allocation. And I th it sounds to me like not knowing anything about Gabe and his life, like it sounds like they're kind of kicking butt. Like, yes. you know what? When you have that pension, it is a beautiful thing. And if I had to give advice to anyone who has a child who's in the um, looking for a spouse or a mate, I would say find someone with a pension. That's a very good-looking person. <laughs> it's true. And a lot of government jobs, you can get that pension relatively young. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, can you filter by that on dating apps, you think? I hope pension? so. I think that would be an excellent thing, right? Seeking person with pension. I was going to start uh, Tinder for FICO scores. <laughs> oh, that's actually good. Or there's like almost like a socialist aspect to it. You could be like someone with a high score goes with someone with a low score. So uh, we bring everybody <laughs> together, go. right? It's true. a beautiful yeah. thing. All right. Another question? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, everyone in the uh, in the chat is, is helping us out with some uh, some audio issues. So we're, we're doing this live, you know, as a famous person once said. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, up next, we have the following. I'm thinking of completing a large remodel of my kitchen and trying to think through a home equity loan and staying invested with the cash needed mm. versus just paying for the remodel with cash. This remodel would probably cost around $80,000, which is about 13% of my taxable assets. How do you know when, uh, when you should use a home equity loan at high rates versus just paying cash? All right, so this was a much easier decision when you could get a home equity loan for 3%, right? So the hurdle rate's much higher. My simple way of looking at this is this is what a home equity loan is for. Right? The whole point of it is to use it. You have your house as the asset that you borrow against, and then you use it to renovate the house and maybe increase the value of it. The HELOC is tax advantaged. So I think it, it's – and the other thing is – so this is the way my HELOC works. So you have 10 years of an interest-only loan and 15 years to pay it off from there. It's like a mortgage. Yeah, absolutely. So I see even with rates higher, I still think it makes sense. I feel like there you have to know yourself also, right? So if this is not going to be a big deal, it's not going to keep you up at night, I agree. You know, this is the purpose of it. You'll pay it off. It'll be fine. Um, if you are the kind of person, and I've met these people who are allergic to the debt. Anti-debt people. They're yes. just really, and it just will keep you up. And, you know, if you said to me, it's 13% of my taxable assets, of which, by the way, uh, most of that is in cash right now anyway, then if it's going to keep you up at night, uh, yeah, sure. I am always concerned with people who pay for these projects. They say, I'm going to pay for it in cash. Who here owns a home? Uh, I do. Uh, who here has ever come in on budget for a project of That's a true. renovation? Uh, nobody. Or that on would be, time. Yeah. I mean, so I I always worry when people say it's eighty grand. I'm like, yeah, that's probably going to be a hundred. Yeah, add at least twenty percent premium. Right? Exactly right. Yeah. So um, and also then like pay that HELOC down like a madman. Yes, and then you really hate it. it. Yeah. And the other thing is the rates could fall too. Like the rates are higher now. If rates fall, then these are market rates. They'll fall too. Exactly right. So, but this is the whole point, and it's tax advantaged. Yeah, you know the whole. Remember the whole cash out game where people are like, I'm going to take money out of my house. I'm going to invest it. You know that's that coming again when rates fall, though. Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, there's so much home equity. I this. I think there's going to be a renovation boom. I don't know. If, I'm not trying to tell people to buy Home Depot. Wink, wink. But <laughs> let's say mortgage rates fall to four or five percent again. Some off that if the Fed ever lets that happen, there is so much pent up mortgage equity sitting there that people are going to use for something to buy a new house or to trade up or renovate go on a vacation whatever now um of course the law change and uh you are only supposed to deduct the home equity loans that are associated with your home right so if you decide you're going to take it out and go on vacation or take it out and put it in the stock market then theoretically that's not kosher right. although i don't know how they catch it right but I, yeah it's tax advantage if you use it for a renovation right yes okay all right Next so question. That, that question was from Matt. Matt. Up next, we have a question from Todd. Todd writes, my question is regarding a brokerage account that holds six individual stocks with a value of almost $60,000 and a cost basis of $15,000. Uh, obviously, this account has done quite well, not to brag, and all the <laughs> holdings are long-term. I want to diversify, particularly one holding, which is 40% of this account. Oh, uh, I'd like to move the majority of these positions to index funds, but selling the stocks would cause a capital gain uh, tax burden of over $6,000, which is cash out of my pocket as far as I'm aware. This has me frozen. I want to lock in the gains, but blowing $6,000 in cash to do so seems unwise. Do I bite the bullet and take the tax hit? Okay, so Todd forexed his money, 15000 to 60000 He definitely bought NVIDIA, right? Probably. If we're being honest, that's his big position. Do Is it long-term or short-term? That's what I want to know, capital gains-wise. I really uh, That actually will make a difference in my that's advice. That's a good point, yeah. Okay, let's assume they're long-term. Okay, okay, good. Let's assume they're long-term. Uh, and what are we assuming, a 15% capital gains rate for Todd? That's fair. So, he yeah, he said $6,000 would be the position mm -hmm. he locks in his gains. So he, and he's wondering, well, does that 6 k have to come out of my pocket? And the simple answer is, if he sells these stocks, he can use the use proceeds, proceeds. pay for the taxes, set pay it aside. The, I say pay the tax and don't look back. I am I am a very happy person. If you could say to me, you'll pay long-term capital gains at 15% all day long, like sold, sold, sold. I want to sign up for 15%. Todd, maybe you're going to move up in your earnings. Maybe you'll be in the 20% capital gains rate. Maybe you'll be at the 23.8% rate. So I'd love to know also more about like the trajectory of what his income is going to be. And I just never think it's a bad idea to take money off the table. He won it, the game. Yeah, you're, you, you, like, you already won. Exactly and he, and right. And he knows I need to be more diversified. I hit the jackpot here. 
waiting longer could mean some of those gains go away. Would that make you feel better? Yeah, you don't right. Have to pay those gains if they're not there anymore. Right. So I taxes are always a consideration of these things, but you can't let the tax tail way, wag the portfolio dog, right? So I, I mean, you could think about trying to find losses elsewhere to offset some of the gains, but yeah, just set the money aside when you sell the stocks. Yeah. All set. Bills paid. See you next. See you next year, Uncle Sam. There you go. All if right. you need some help with some losses too, just hit me up. I'm happy, <laughs> happy to help. <laughs> Wait, that's a different show. It's a, the Losers Show. <laughs> that's a real. Yeah, that would be like my. Yeah, let me let me show you my portfolio of media stocks. We, we talk a lot about my Ovi stock, but my other biggest holding is Tesla. So. Uh, it's, oh, it's been a rough yeah, time for you. Rough. Okay. Duncan yeah. is trying to save the planet with his portfolio, and that's so nice. I know. It's not yeah. working. really good. Yeah, it's it's not going well so far. Uh, okay, so up next we have a question from Jamie. I like this one. This is a this is a car question. I wanted to ask. <laughs> we a haven't question. had any car questions. Actually. No, I I love cars, so this is perfect. All right. I wanted to ask a question regarding my car and the cost of a long commute. I currently drive a 2008 VW that gets 24 miles per gallon, and have a 145 uh, mile round trip commute. Oof, brutal. I have spent over six thousand dollars this year on fuel alone. Hmm. I do all of my own maintenance and repairs. Should I be looking for a newer, more fuel-efficient car to bring costs down? My car is paid off, and with the prices of a new car, I'm not sure the payment would be worth it. This is this one hits home uh, close to home for me because mm. I used to commute from D.C. to Baltimore every day, and which isn't as long as this person's commute. But, but yeah, that's that's brutal. I had an hour one-way commute my very first job, so two hours a day on the road. This is like pre-podcast. Uh, I almost lost my mind. So you're not going to be very surprised when someone wears a jacket like this. I don't know how to do my own car repairs and maintenance. But the fact that this person does, they're already way ahead of the game. Totally. Right? So they probably, I don't know, do their own oil changes and that sort of thing. Probably paint their own house. Yes. So, I mean, interest rates are much higher. So buying a new car is going to be way more expensive. New car prices have risen. I did a piece this week about auto insurance being up 22% in the last year. It's crazy. So those rates are going to be higher with a new car. So I don't think, even if you bought an electric vehicle, the savings alone are not going to be enough, I don't think, because the it's going to be more expensive, the charger. And you probably, if he knows how to do maintenance on this car, probably doesn't know how to do it on an electric vehicle. That's so. what I was thinking. The, the one thing there would be with the federal and state uh, tax incentives right. that might help them with an EV. But, and the, the cost of maintenance is very low for EVs, like almost non existent. But they're unless a lot more it expensive breaks. up front. But, but also, but unless it breaks, in sure. which case it's expensive. Sure, yeah. Uh, I'm sort of like, I wanted to know how many miles are on this car. It's got to be, I was thinking that too. It's, it's got to be a ton. It's right? Be, so, I, I, he probably knows that they're it's it's the, coming. It's coming. Yes, the end of the day. I would try here. to like stockpile some cash if I were in this situation and think about well, you know, let me stockpile cash. Let me keep doing what I'm doing right now. It, it is always much more um, af- efficient and uh, wiser to drive a car until it dies. But then if it dies at the wrong time and you don't have enough money set aside, you are kind of screwed. I'm with you though. Like. The cost of a new car is ridiculous. Car insurance is ridiculous. I understand all the reasons why. I understand that car prices are up. I understand that we're driving more. I understand that we're getting into more accidents. I get all those things. Um, But at the end of the day, if the cost of owning this car is with everything all in, I don't know, like $1,000 a year, and then you just have to pay you for gas, uh, I don't think you're going to do better buying an EV right now. I just don't. I would, I, I mean, probably what I would do is really think about, well, should I be buying a hybrid? Maybe that's a help. And get some incentive, some sort of tax incentive, and I would stockpile cash just in case. Yeah, and this is a person who could probably maybe buy a used car, too, if they know how to fix them up. Yeah. My, my only problem with hybrids is just you still have an ICE engine, which are the ones, that's what causes so much maintenance, you know what I mean? So yeah. it's like... That's the the trick. You still have to get oil changes with a hybrid. With this guy's you know doing I mean? his own oil. It's true. That that definitely helps. Yeah, I've been there. I had an old Jeep. I used to hit the alternator with a hammer. Nice. Break down on the road. I always so, joke yeah. when I get an oil change, they they put the dipstick in and they show it to me, <laughs> and I have to pretend like I know what they're talking about. Like they could sh- they could literally dip it in avocado. Yeah. You know. It's a, oh, that's and a great. I would have oh, no oh, idea. This was a, in fact our olive oil tasting. We just use a dipstick instead. It's <laughs> right. perfect. I, they show me and I'm like, yeah, look, you're sure looks. They can show me anything. You see, uh, luckily, because I'm a girl, they don't even try to show that to me. They, don't, <laughs> they presume you're just an idiot. So that that's my world. All right. So you don't have to pretend then. No, exactly. I, I, I am did, an idiot when it comes to cars. I did look up the lowest cost of ownership vehicle. Any guesses? The lowest cost of ownership Camry vehicle. Camry or Accord? I was going to say a Honda Civic. So the the uh, hybrid Camry came up uh, in, as one of the top ones, um, but the Chevy Bolt. 
Oh, was, was the oh. One but is that done? I think they just discontinued. They're done it. with yeah, that. Yeah, but um, that was that was the one. Do that you came think up. that that's like the most embarrassing car to drive on the road to be? <laughs> like, I no shade to Camry feet people. Like, I get it, but like, someone you're like, I am in a. Camry, like you're not feeling good about that. There's no way you're feeling good about that, right? That's or wait, fair. maybe maybe it's a Corolla. I get those confused. Camry versus Corolla. well, Camry's like the more of like the sedan. The okay. Corolla is the smaller one. Okay, okay. This might have been the hybrid Corolla then. That, that might you know what my dream car is? Which is Honda Accord. It I is. Would, you I love have, that. I car? have three kids, so I can't. I have to drive an SUV. I want to drive a Honda Accord. Wait, aren't you driving one of those big minivans? No, it's. I just. I have a Ford Explorer, so. You know, that's Has like a it? Honda Accord of SUVs. Okay. See, All I right. thought I thought you had like a lifted truck. You know what I mean? Yeah. I that's not quite. I, I've been on an anti-truck crusade for many years. That people think seventy thousand dollar trucks they should not be able to do so unless I see a five twenty nine plan and an IRA and an emergency savings account first. Then or you can buy a, a seventy thousand dollar truck. Or a large piece of equipment in that truck that is needed. Yes. Like that you need a truck for that. Like I'm going to tell everybody on the Long Island Expressway and the Garden State Parkway. I guarantee you don't need that truck. Yes. Are you actually Rob. using it? <laughs> he doesn't have a truck. I drive 10-year-old cars. I'm the worst. I interviewed the guy who's like the car guy at Consumer Reports. He thinks it's pathetic. He's. I call him from dealerships at, on December 30th. I'm like, I'm about to bid on this car. How much should I pay? So you wait till – that's a good strategy. You wait till the end of the month because they have to hit their quotas. And the year. The end of the year is oh, key. Okay. December 30th is beautiful. It is funny how antiquated that seems as a process, but it still works. Mm-hmm. Go it at does. the end of the month. Yeah, Exactly. All right, what next we question. Got? All right, up next we have a question from Amanda. Um, this one's kind of coming at you. I don't know if you, you if think you so? looked at it. I think, I think this one's coming at you. Uh-oh. Okay. Uh, I get all the stuff Ben has been saying about inflation. Wages have kept pace. Economic growth has been higher than the 2010s. Wages have risen the most for lower-income people, et cetera. I get all that. My husband and I own a house and own stocks, so we've benefited in recent years. Having said all that, this is all caps if you're shouting at Oh, me. boy. I still can't get over how high price, prices are. The grocery store, home and auto insurance, restaurants, babysitters for the kids, everything is more expensive. How do I get over the sticker shock? Will it just eventually fade away uh, as we get used to higher prices? I, I think there is a huge psychological component to inflation. Mm-hmm. So I, I wrote a piece a few, weeks, a few weeks ago saying that after Daniel Kahneman passed away, saying his loss aversion concept is the most important one in finance, right? Losses sting twice as bad as gains feel good. Yep. I think for inflation, that's on steroids. So when my wages go up, those are deserved. When inflation and purchasing power goes down or prices go up, that feels unfair. So loss aversion impacts inflation way higher. So if you, if you look at it, actually, the CPI in the 2010s for the whole decade was up uh, 20% in total. Yeah. We had that same 20% happen in the first four years of this decade. Yeah. Literally the same magnitude, just in a more compressed period of time. And so people didn't get a chance to get used to those higher prices because they can still see in the rearview mirror what they used to be, even though the, the total magnitude is the same just in a shorter period of time. So I think people just feel it more. I agree. I mean, I, th- I feel what Amanda is saying, that you can, in your brain, you can process all of the data and understand this. But then all of a sudden, like, the amygdala lights up when you're in the grocery store and you're like, what is yeah. going on here? And so, Amanda, what I would say is you're going to get used to it. Time will pass, and we'll get used to it. I mean, I grew up in a time where, you know, we had to uh, wait in line to get gas in the 70s because there was an oil embargo, and the price of oil skyrocketed. And at that time, energy prices going up was a much bigger bite of a household income. But I think that what Amanda is saying, it does give voice to the sense, as you said, like, we're human beings, we are have we have emotions. And you we can't have, help it. You cannot help it. So maybe the best thing to the way to think about it is like we have emotional responses to a lot of things. There are emotional responses to like your mother calling you at the wrong time, and then all of a sudden you get older and you're like, nah, it's not that big a deal. You'll get used to it. Amanda, you're going to get used to your mother, and you're going to get used so to. So John, these give me a, give me a chart on this. Is inflation since the 1950s? So this is the average inflation rate since the 1950s. Uh, it's 3.5%, but I looked at this. Do you know what percentage of the time we've actually had since 1950, the annual inflation rate go deflationary and go down? How many? What percentage of the time? Oh, my guess? God. It has to be less than 5% of the well, time. It's like, it's like less than 4. Yeah. So 96% of the time, prices are rising. So it is something you have to get used to. People just notice some more when it's going up higher. And the other thing is, I always say, if you take the stock market average, whatever, 9 or 10% a year, 
any given year, you're never going to be close to the average, right? It rarely happens. It's usually yeah. a big up year, a big down year. There's rarely like a 9% annual return. The same is true with inflation. You could show any household the actual inflation rate, and no one has that for their own household. It, if you own a home with a 3% mortgage versus someone who rents, that's a big deal, right? Someone who just purchased a home with a 7% mortgage is doing a lot worse than someone who purchased a home five years ago with a 3% mortgage. If you have to buy a new car recently, like Jamie, that so all these different things, this is why no one believes the inflation rate is real because no one actually experiences the average. Mm-hmm. We, or Everyone is an outlier. Yeah. And I also think that um, it feels like something that should not happen. Yes. And especially if you're under the age of, say, 45, and you've never been in a period where where prices have gone up, and we never have seen it go up by so much so quickly, that it's, it is off-putting. It's sort of, it's, it's jarring. Yes. And so that I totally do get. And I feel like we should sort of forgive ourselves a little bit. Like, yeah, you're going to freak out a little bit. But, you know, like if the prices at the, at the restaurant freak you out, then uh, don't go out. How about have an extra meal at home? That's a thing. This awesome. is what we've talked about a, a decent amount. Like, at some point, consumers do have to stand up and say, like, yeah, I won't pay that. Yeah, but restaurant. they haven't. I mean, the yeah, retail right. sales numbers are ridiculous. Right. And so everyone's like, Meh, and I do it, too. I go out to dinner, and I'm like, oh, my God, $45 for this entree? Like, really? No. And uh, and then, of course, my wife will say to me, well, don't order roast chicken that you make at home <laughs> and right. pay $45 for a dum-dum. I had to pay $18 for a for a. Fruity drink in a peacock cup last night. Can you believe that? What kind of fruity drink? Uh, it was some sort of spicy margarita, and it came in like a peacock cup. It was a novelty drink, and I saw someone else drinking, and I said, "I have to get it." I, and and okay, so That's, and did they laugh at you for, for that. ordering that? <laughs> I'm just wanting to make sure. No, yes, like, yes. I feel free, but hey, I. I uh, did you enjoy it? It was pretty good. All right. Oh, that's all that matters. That like is a, good. It was a spicy bird. I okay. mean, in New York City, the average like a cocktail is a ridiculous number. So I'm like. The, this is a great thing to do. Like when you're in the burbs and you have to drive someplace, you can't like pregame at home. But in New York City, you really can. Like yeah. take a shot at tequila and go out. That's true. You know, there is something that feels worse about paying a lot for a cheap beer, though. It's like I don't want to pay six dollars for a Narragansett or yeah. something. Like I'd be happier to pay eleven dollars for like a craft beer. Or you something hit the nail like on the head, though. As Americans, we feel entitled to still pay for stuff, even though it's more expensive. We just want to complain about it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, listen, I, I am happy to be a complainer as well. All right, we have one more question. That's okay. it? This is another good one. Yeah. Uh, is it is it throwing shade at you again? No, no. no <laughs> that this wasn't, is a, a, good that one. wasn't a ton that of wasn't, shade. No, that was no, fine. All, all caps. caps was yelling at you, though. Okay. Yeah. You know, but yeah. Fair. Uh, okay, so this one's from Michael. I'm 20, live in Minnesota, and work as a package handler at UPS. I've been seeing articles about automation and AI being mm. used at UPS in beta form. I know my job could be replaced by AI or robots, and I don't know what to do. I have no education and dropped out of high school, but I do own a home and have renters living with me. I also have a retirement account with $80,000 in it, so I have some optionality. If I were laid off, I would get a good payout because I'm union, but by that point, it might be too late to switch careers. Thoughts? I, I, I want to tell you my first thought is, like, are you kidding me? This guy's 20 years old. It's he has 80 right? grand and he owns a home? Right. Yes. I, I, I am... First of all, Michael, you're amazing. Yeah. Fantastic. He's been educated in life. I mean, right? that's tremendous. I mean, look, I think we all have to be thinking about how do our jobs and the tasks that we do, how are they being replaced? Yeah, and so, And I think it's, it's everybody who's working at UPS to a big investment banking firm to a law firm. Like, the, there is going to be a revolution. So in Michael's case, I kind of would like go back and be like, what's he actually doing at UPS? And where is that skill transferable? And sh- is there a way that UPS can use an employee like him who's been successful and go someplace else in the organization? I'm, I'm always interested in that. Someone is going to need to service the robots and pay attention to them yes. somehow, right? So there's going to still need to be people there. Even, even if we have, like, these self-driving trucks on the road, you're going to need Jamie, the mechanic, in there to fix it when it breaks down. So there's gonna need, people are still going to be involved even if the robots take over the world. And maybe the coolest thing in the world for Michael to do is to go to his boss and say, like, you know what? Like, basically ask this question, like, not the other stuff, not about all the money I have. I'm really kind of nervous about this. I'd love to be on the team that thinks about how we're going to transition people who are really good people and loyal to this company and keep them in the company. Yes. That right. would be yeah. all into that, yeah. right? Yeah, be the person who kind of steps up and says, I want to help with this transition. 20 years old, 80 grand in retirement and owns a house. Yeah. That's impressive. Or, or he could sabotage the robots when they come in. You well, that's I mean? a possibility so, as well. I mean, I didn't always, think about that. You're right. Yeah. Hmm, yeah. That doesn't end well in the movies. <laughs> yeah, no. No. They always no, they, they win. Yeah. They win. All right. 
This has been great. We had a, this is like a very diverse set of questions we've had today. Yeah, I like these. This was a good set. We always have good ones, but this was a, uh, an especially good. Amanda, set. I want to hear from you. I want to talk to Amanda and talk about okay. why she's so <laughs> mad at you. Okay. Bring the bring All the caps. temperature down. Maybe Amanda needs to have a shot of tequila before she goes out. Yes. But then she'd pay fourteen dollars for it, so she'd be mad. No, she's going to pay. Have it at home. Oh, oh I got you. Okay. So we have a new Jill on Money this weekend with Josh and Michael. Is that correct? No, it's not this weekend. It's going to be Next. the following weekend. Next week. Following. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We have All things right. happening. Though. All right. There's a lot uh, going on. New Compound and Friends tomorrow. I may or may not be on it. What? Why not? Hint, hint. No, I, I am. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, Do you know we put Nicole on camera yesterday? Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I still didn't get one of the hats yet. Uh, ask the compound show at gmail.com is our email here. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thank you.